Good afternoon, class, and welcome to the uh, second lecture presentation for the uh, philosophy and religion of religion course. Uh, my name is Andrew Bridges. I'll be the instructor. And today we're going to be uh, discussing uh, four arguments for the existence of God and also the counter arguments for the non existence of God. I prepared a PowerPoint for this presentation. So I will share the screen and uh, share the PowerPoint. One moment, please. Okay, there we go. So this is also taken, uh, much of the material is taken from the big questions text. I use the eighth edition, uh, chapter three, which is on entitled God. And I've entitled this presentation, Arguments for the Existence and Non-Existence of God. And uh, we'll be going through four of these arguments. Any quotes I present will be from the uh, big questions text by Robert Solomon and Kathleen Higgins. And so the arguments we'll be going over today are the uh, cosmological argument, argument uh, from design, ontological argument, and uh, Pascal's wager. And so I'm going to review the definitions of each briefly, and then I will discuss each argument and the counter arguments in more detail. So the argument from design, and this is from the glossary in the uh, big tech, uh, big questions text, um, uh, eighth edition, an argument that attempts to prove that God exists because of the intricacies of design of nature and design of nature. The basis of the argument is that because the universe is all is so well designed, it must have a designer. Uh, the analogy most often used is our inference from finding a complex mechanism on the beach, actually it was in a field. Um, uh, for example, a watch that there must have been an intelligent being who created it. So much like the watch in, um, required an intelligent being to create it, uh, the human being. So the, the galaxy and the solar system and all of its complex motion uh, required a uh, tantamount creator uh, Creator God. The cosmological argument is the argument or set of arguments that undertakes to prove that God exists on the basis of the idea that there must have been a first cause or ultimate reason for the existence of the universe or cosmos. The Greek word cosmos for universe is where the cosmological argument gets its name. It can be asked, why is there something out of nothing? How did the initial something come into being? And the argument often given is God. The ontological argument, this is why I think it's the most fascinating argument, I'll go into detail on this argument in a second, is an argument or a set of arguments that tries to prove the existence of God from the very concept of God. For example, God by definition is a being with all possible perfections, perfections, existence is a perfection, therefore God exists. This might not be clear initially from, from this presentation, but I'll go into more detail on this. This could also be, um, uh, reasoning by logical implication, i.e. the implication of the concept from the very concept of God, as opposed to uh, the experience of a variety of things, we can uh, conclude that God exists. And we'll, I'll go over an argument uh, for this. And then finally, Pascal's wager is the argument by Pascal um, that it is prudent to believe in God because if God exists and you believe, uh, you will be eternally rewarded, but if God exists and you do not believe, you'll be eternally punished. So this is seen in a particular paradigm in which uh, perhaps multiple paradigms are not taken into perspective, but we'll also look at this argument. So these are the four arguments we're gonna be looking at in this um, uh, second uh, lecture presentation. So the cosmological arguments. So, Essentially, everything has to be caused uh, by or created by something else. Therefore, there must have been a first cause, what Aristotle calls a prime mover. And this cause is God. If we refer back to the first lecture on definitions, this could be a deistic concept of God. This is asking um, how the universe came into being. And, and often it is positive that the best explanation for this is a God. And um, also, uh, if the universe existed, but just existed in, in this one state. How did change occur? Maybe this agent of change is, is a God. So this argument supposes that, um, or, or infers by inference of the best explanation, that, that the reason uh, for existence is a God, and therefore God exists because the universe does exist. Now, one of the assignments we've been given is um, 
to uh, listen to uh, Hume's uh, Dialogues on Natural Religions. Uh, I suggest that it's when you listen to it via the audiobook, it's about um, four hours. Be sure to listen to the first two hours in the first two weeks. By the first four weeks, listen to all of it, basically an hour a week. So Hume has a few replies to this, uh, particularly uh, through the character, I believe, uh, Philo. And so one reply to this is, uh, this is just sort of begging the question. It's, we can ask again, uh, well, how did God come into existence? And then the reply might be something like, well, God is a being so great that uh, God can neither be created or, or destroyed but created. And, and so God always existed. So Hume, via, via the character, uh, says, well, why can't we just say the same thing about the universe? Let's just say the universe is eternal. And many other religious models posit the universe being eternal, particularly in the uh, Dharmic traditions, that the universe is eternal and operates in, in the karmic principles. Uh, car, uh, principles of action. So, so one uh, reply to the uh, to the cosmological argument is just to reply that the universe itself is eternal. Whatever um, allowances we make for the concept of God, we could just equally make to the uh, concept of the universe. So, if you select this this uh, argument to try to prove or disprove, be sure to include. Uh, aspects of everything that's been said so far, what the argument is, what a possible objection is, such as the one by Hume, and then also then try to evaluate, say, okay, given the uh, initial argument and given uh, Hume's reply to the argument, uh, what is the merit of the argument? Evaluate the argument. Is this a good argument? What could make this argument better? So, so this is essentially uh, one way to proceed with the cosmological argument. So next is the argument from design. So uh, Paley is, is uh, often the one uh, credited with this argument uh, from design. Um, and it's also an argument uh, by analogy between our findings, uh, between our finding a watch in a field and the uh, assuming that a person must have been there and are seeing the intricate design of the world and concluding that some intelligent creator must have made it. Um, and so this idea of if you find a watch in a field, you assume that it didn't just get uh, created by, by random, uh, by um, just like, I don't, I don't even know how that would be. It, it sort of defies imagination. Um, and so uh, you assume obviously that there was a creator. And when we look at the uh, cosmos and the intricacies of the variety of uh, empirical experience, we, we can draw a similar analogy that there was a creator. Now, there's two different types of replies to this. And the first one we might say was, is Darwin's reply with um, the theory of evolution and uh, origin of species. And then we might go through Voltaire's reply. They're, they're slightly different, but I want to address uh, both. So, so um, given the theory of evolution, it essentially suggests that our existence was just due to uh, randomness. Uh, random uh, mutation, adaptation, and that our species um, was not sort of divinely created and each species in its kind was sort of divinely uh, created the way certain uh, creation narratives might say, but rather it was just a process of natural selection and the origin of species um, solely evolved through basically randomness. Uh, science fiction uh, novel, that, that sort of place this out even further might be uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Galapagos, in which a um, group of people survive a uh, deadly disease on the Galapagos Island and live there for uh, millions of years afterwards. And after millions of years, um, they sort of change into a different species. It's more like a otter or a seal. And, and, uh, and therefore, it's just, there was nothing particularly um, intelligently designed about the human being from a creator standpoint. It's just a series of randomness. One species goes into existence, out of existence, depending on how well it adapts, then another species gets created. Another way of looking at um, this, this uh, whole, whole Darwinian scope in relation to what Paley is saying is that uh, if circumstances had been different, which they just seem to be arbitrarily there, 
uh, the human species may have never come into existence and other species uh, may have not come into existence. So it's not that it's sort of like a divine plan with providence and, and sort of uh, specifications, the way we would build a watch with a purpose and a design. It's just sort of the effects of randomness, right? So that's one way of sort of undercutting this analogy between, um, between the uh, randomness that's proposed by evolutionary theory and the um, intricacy of, intricacies of design that's sort of proposed by Paley's analogy. Uh, Voltaire would be a, a different example of, of um, arguing against uh, design. And th this would be that he, he would argue that um, there, there is no design. Just if you look out into the world, any, any sort of design we might uh, impose upon the world or think is natural is just us imposing design on the world or rather us working really hard so the world is in good working order. Think of all the different jobs we have to do, right? There's, um, think of all the different jobs that go into building a house. Or if you go out to, to eat, think of all the different jobs uh, associated with preparing the food, right? And if the, if the universe was um, um, created with an intelligent design, Voltaire would argue that it would just come sort of pre-made. Humans would just be created and there'd be beautiful houses for them to live in and food would come cooked. And there's, um, but many times you'll still have these very funny scenes. It's like, yes, if, if the world was designed well, you know, uh, turkeys would just be cooked. They would just be made cooked. They, they wouldn't be made live and running around and have to do all this work to get them, um, get them um, ready to eat if, if we, we do eat them. And, and uh, also, you know, people would uh, be born with glasses um, and, and um, to help them see, and they'd be born clothed. And, and every, um, every aspect of work that we have to do is really a way of saying that this was not designed, this world experience was not designed in an intelligent way, but rather we humans work really hard to uh, uh, create order out of the chaos. And so these are two different replies to the argument to design. So we've heard um, from design. So we've heard uh, Paley's analogy and we hear the logic to it. And then we have one uh, um, counter argument uh, given uh, Darwin's ideas, another counter argument given Voltaire's ideas. So if you select this argument and, and, and like it, so, so first describe what the argument is, then describe the objections. Then if you think that uh, the argument is still good, describe the replies to the objections. And um, then if you think uh, the argument is overpowered by the objections, then explain why. So this would be, this would be another argument to select. Ontological argument. Um, we cannot conceive of God except as an infinite and most perfect being, a being who had all perfections except the most, except for the perfection of existence, would not be most perfect. Therefore, the most perfect being uh, necessarily exists. Um, and so, this is a deductive argument as opposed to an inductive argument. Deductive argument is an argument uh, in which you reason from necessity particularly logical implication. And here, logical implication, in particular, the implication of the concept, i.e. the concept God. This argument attempts, what this argument attempts to do is say from the very concept of God, we can argue that God necessarily exists, not just probably exists, but necessarily exists. I think the most concise elaboration on Anselm's ontological argument that I've read is by, uh, Norman uh, Malcolm, in, who writes Anselm's Ontological Arguments. I've included uh, the article in the canvas and for, for YouTube, I've included it in the link. So, so you may want to take a look at it, particularly if you want to do this for more research. I'll summarize his article now. So he basically explains that God um, is a being or the concept of God is greater uh, than any concept in existence. Right, so, so, so God is a concept greater than which nothing else can be conceived. This is the concept of God. Um, therefore, given this concept, God would have either, either had to always exist or never exist, right? So we're having a, a choice here. Either God always existed or never existed. How do we get to that? 
Well, we get to that because if God was created, which is the, the third option, then God would not be uh, greater than anything we could conceive because how would God have been created? Something else would have had to create God and that would not make God God anymore, the concept of God. So God either had to always exist or God could never exist because God can't be created because if God were to be created, then it would make God not the most powerful concept. Okay, from that line of deduction, we have the idea therefore that God's existence is either necessary, logically speaking, or impossible, right? Because by definition, God's, uh, if God always existed, his existence or its existence would be necessary. And if God never existed, then it, God could not be created and the existence would be impossible. God's existence, third line of the proof, God's existence is not impossible, logically speaking, right? Certain ideas or concepts are logically impossible, such as a a square circle or a round square, a four-sided triangle. These things make absolutely no sense. They're logically absurd. The concept of God is not logically absurd. So God's existence is not impossible. Here you have a disjunctive argument. God's existence is either necessary or impossible, not impossible, therefore necessary, and therefore you get the existence of God. It's a fascinating argument. Uh, most are, are not very compelled by it. You might ponder as to why you've heard the logic. The deductive logic is sound. Are the premises uh, correct? This is a fascinating idea. Can you go from the concept of something to, uh, to its existence? Uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, in his, um, 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 what are they called? The... Um, the four antinomies, he'll take issue with this and he'll, he'll say essentially that there's a difference between having the concept uh, of a hundred dollars and having a hundred dollars. Those are very different things. And in almost all concepts they are, but some would argue not the concept of God. Why? Because it's the greater than anything that can be conceived and that allows it to actually have that additional premise that God's existence is either necessary or impossible. If you like this argument, if you find it interesting, uh, try to think of counter arguments and then respond to it. And our fourth and final argument is Pascal's wager, right? Either we believe in God or we don't. If we believe in God and God exists, we will be rewarded with infinite bliss. If we believe in God, but uh, God's existence doesn't exist, then the worst that uh, has happened is that we have been given, we have given up a few sinful pleasures. So let's talk about that paradigm of obedience, doing good and right stuff. If we do not believe in God and God does exist, we will be uh, punished with eternal damnation. So we're, we're talking about a particular uh, uh, sort of cosmological view. If we do not believe in God and God does not exist, then of course there is no problem. Now there are many, uh, many replies to this. We, we think of maybe uh, Carlyle or, or um, it's a good example that says maybe we shouldn't take it seriously or we should try to live in such a way where um, if God did exist, we're still okay. And if uh, life was just a dream or a joke, um, we'd still be okay. So maybe it's not an either or type of thing. It might be one objection. This would be Carlyle and, and to a certain extent, uh, Renan. Um, but um, another objection could be, there could be two different uh, objections or counter arguments to this. And I think they're both just different aspects of the same, is uh, this is just looking at it um, from a, a certain type of metaphysical or cosmological worldview. Uh, it's an either or decision, right? It could be the case that God exists or God does not exist, but there could be other options if we take a more pluralistic approach, right? Reincarnation could also be true, right? And then, and so it's not just, um, it's not just, a, a question of belief or disbelief, according to uh, Pascal, now that we sort of brought it in, into a global context, it could be a possibility of three or, or much more than three, right? Either God exists or God does not exist, or, or uh, maybe uh, 
the karmic theory as opposed to a, a uh, in this context, a, a, a Catholic Christian notion of God um, exist or, or, um, or maybe a uh, karmic understanding of, of the soul and the afterlife exists. But now we have three options, so it can't just be either or. Could be possible that a, a, a type of universal salvation exists, which, which some Catholic theologies uh, now look to. So not, not a uh, option of belief, salvation, disbelief, damnation, uh, there could be a purgatory, there could be a universal salvation. So, so the thing that might um, perplex this argument a bit will be just multiple options. So it's not necessarily an either or. And this is often a question of piety, what would be proper action? So proper action in this course would be uh, doing what uh, this God says, and this God couched in the Catholic Christian paradigm, there's instruction in piety, right? Um, but, but again, there could just be a variety of pious actions. And given this multitude of choices, this wager would not be as easily, easy. Others might argue that this is not necessarily what uh, belief is. And this is also a fascinating thing. Is, is belief just sort of uh, hedging your bets on, on trying to make the best decision given uh, not knowing, right? Or is belief something else? Is belief trying to show that there is a different rational way, or perhaps a, a non-rational way of belief in God. So this has been a uh, quick overview of the four arguments that we'll be um, reading uh, more about in the um, big question text. And we'll be also hearing arguments and counter arguments, not necessarily for the ontological, nor for Pascal's wager, but rather for the cosmological and the argument from design in, in Hume's uh, dialogues on natural religion, which uh, do do read in, in the next, uh, read the first part in the next two weeks. Okay, I hope that uh, you all have enjoyed uh, this presentation on the uh, four arguments uh, for the existence of God and their counter arguments for the non-existence or at least for the suspension of judgment of God. Uh, take care and uh, have a good weekend.